if you would, turn your Bibles to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, that's uh, in the Old Testament, chapter 3. We want to look at verses 19 through 26. Lamentations. From the weeping prophet Jeremiah. And just give you a little background. Jerusalem has been under siege. I mean, they have been destroyed. The walls have come down. The, the destruction of the temple. The temple was burnt. And, and just incredible uh, incredible times of which uh, Jeremiah lived. And he witnessed all these things. It was terrible. I mean, they starved the people and there was cannibalism inside the city. And it just all kinds of atrocities were taking place, which is not too far different from the world that we live in today. Terrible things were taking place. In Jeremiah, or Lamentations chapter 3, in verses 19 through 26, it says, Remember my affliction and my wandering and the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. And this I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore I have hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the person who seeks Him. It is good for that He waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. I was thinking about uh, this message, and uh, I entitled it, uh, The Second Wind. And I couldn't help but remember a time when I was a junior in college and we were in physical education class and Hugh Harmon was our instructor at the Bible College and he said, we're going to have a, a mile run and we're going to map this thing out uh, through the streets of Oregon and go down by the river and back over uh, near the church and then back up, I think it was 4th Street or whatever the main street was, and then back to the college. And we're going to just do this for an experiment. And uh, anyway, in our class, we had, there were some athletes in our class. I mean, there was this one young man from Virginia, and uh, he had a football scholarship. I mean, he looked like a man's man. He was, he was big, he's husky, but he was also, he was thin and lean too. His, and he was, he was strong and, and uh, he worked out. He was very muscular and he prided himself uh, in his physique. And uh, there was another young man who was, had been, who prided himself as being a cross country runner. And he'd been running regular through the semester. And, and anyway, I want to tell you where I was coming from. I had not had the best year of my life. In fact, it had been one of the worst, up to that point, this was the worst year of my entire life. And things hadn't gone really good my junior year. There was the breakup of a serious relationship. There was hurt and humiliation and disappointment and, and some loss of prestige. And, 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 and my self-esteem was really uh, at an all-time low, I would say. But I was a pretty good runner, too, and I knew that. And I had a similar experience in, in my junior high days. But we took off, the, the gun sounded, and we took off on the race. And I was running about fourth, and, and then I kind of moved up to third, and, and kind of keeping a steady pace. And going into the last couple of blocks, I passed this rather physique football scholarship a uh, friend of mine, uh, I, I was thinking, man, this is pretty cool. I'm, I'm passing uh, Lynn Boyer. And, and, and we're getting down. There's one runner ahead of me, and we get down to the last block. And I'm thinking, I think I've got a little gas left in me. And so I take off and pass the lead runner and win the race. And it was kind of a good feeling, I have to say. And uh, I don't have, have any of you runners had this experience? It was a kind of a case of catching a second win. 
And runners talk about this. I read an article on the internet about getting a second win. Now these are marathon runners and so, I, you know, it's quite a bit different. Runners describe the feeling of the second win as this increased confidence, improved performance, less strenuous breathing, often just as they were starting to feel overwhelmed by fatigue. And they go on, it says, the only problem with the second win, runners said it is they never know if they're, uh, when to expect it. Sometimes, one writer says, he says, sometimes you'll, you'll never feel that. Sometimes you do, said Joey Howe, 48, a long, lifelong runner and general manager of Cherokee Boulevard running supply store at Fast Break. It's really an unknown, he continued. It's not something I feel every time. It's not even something I can say I feel even half of the time. When it occurs, however, a sensation can be a godsend, said the Chattanooga Track Club President Bill Moran, 60 years of age. To me, it just feels like you have something left in your tank. He said it's a confidence that between your energy stores and your respiration, you feel like you can finish. Your body is telling you, I can do this. You know, sometimes as Christians, we need a second win in our spiritual life. Amen? Then no matter how great a Christian you are, there's going to be some tough times in your life. Storms will come. But the thing that we want to get across this morning is that God is still on the throne and He still wants to encourage you and He will help us through those storms to do whatever we need to do to get on the other side and still be standing. Amen. 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 The word encouragement comes from the root word courage and the action of giving someone support. Kind of like saying amen. amen. Confidence, hope, heartening, cheering up, inspiration, motivation, stimulation, fortification, and I don't know what other kind of nation there is, but it gives you what you need. And God wants to encourage you and to put courage in you. And there's a story, I like this story, a story about a party that was going on on a cruise ship. And I mean, they were really having a party. They were having a good time. And later, up on the stage, different ones, was, including the captain, was giving speeches for this hero that they were having this party for. And each one got up, and he was, he, uh, he, uh, they said uh, different things to give this man praise. But this man, he kind of sat uh, rather solemn. He was kind of looking down on the floor, and he's really not... He's kind of embarrassed about the whole situation. You see, earlier in the day, the woman had, a woman had fallen off the ship and almost drowned, but almost immediately, the man was there at her side in the dark. Hero! And now they were celebrating. They were giving him praise. He was very uncomfortable, however, by the situation, all this praise he was getting. And finally, they wanted him to come up to the microphone and say a few words about what had happened. And so he gets up, rather sheeplessly, and he comes to the microphone, and he says these words, I just want to know, who pushed me? I just want to know, who pushed me? Now that's not courage, is it? But sometimes we get pushed in a direction. We have no intentions of that direction that we're, we're going in. And yet God sees us through it. He gives us the courage to get through it. One of the greatest callings of all as Christians is to be called by God. Ephesians chapter 4, or chapter 1 and verses 4 through 12. I'd like to read that passage of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 and verses uh, 4 through 12. Some of you get that joke later on maybe. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to be 
to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to this kind of intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us, the beloved. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. And he has made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his kind and intention which he purposed in us with a view of an administration suitable to the fullness of the times that is summing up all the things in Christ, things to the heavens and things on the earth in him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Amen and amen. We are called to have courage as Christians in this world. And sometimes this is a pretty scary place that we live in. And along the way, there are going to be times that we're going to need encouragement. That's kind of, the, well, it is the facts of life. Storms will come. And that leads us to this story in uh, the book of Lamentations. These were some of the darkest days in the history of Israel. As you look at Lamentation chapter 3. I mean the walls were coming down. And prophet, he was called the, the weeping prophet for a reason. He cried a lot. He was seeing his, the holy city of God being destroyed by the Babylonians. He was seeing his people being ramished. And he was seeing all the, the destruction and the terrible things. He saw the holy temple that David had built, or Solomon had built, cut down. And, and he was weeping for his country because of its sins. We know that judgment is coming. Jeremiah the prophet was pressed to the point of despair. And here in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 20, he speaks these words, My soul remembers and is bowed down within me. And he's remembering and thinking of some painful, distressing things. And his attitude is affected. And he says in verse 21, This I recall in my mind, therefore I have hope. Notice he makes a change as he's thinking about these terrible things that's going on all around him and in his life. And he sees the destruction and the pain and all that's going on. And he chooses, notice that word, chooses to make a change. His change of form in his mind to hope. And like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, take every thought captive. And that's what we have to do sometimes in order to get our thinking straight and our thinking upon hope rather than in despair. To take every thought captive. My soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions they never fail. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, them. To the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The prophet chose to look at hope and to put his trust in God. Amen. And as we face this world that we're kind of in and we see the things going on in our country and we see these things, the persecution of Christians around the world, we see all this going on, we need to remember and look and change our focus upon the God who loves us and cares for us, who has chosen us, has predestined us and has a plan for our life. Jeremiah, he looked back and he recalled the goodness of God. And he looked up 
And he praised, he gave praise to God for his love and his compassion and his faithfulness. And then he looked forward in confidence and in hope. He was confident that God would supply all his needs according to his riches and glory. And that the God who had begun a good work in him would complete it. Storms will come. But like David, we need to cling to the rock that is higher than us. In Psalm 40 verse 1 it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined me and heard my cry and he brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay and he set my feet on a rock making my footsteps firm. And he put a new song in my heart. Song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and trust in the Lord. What was David saying? He was saying that he had been through some pretty tough times. He had gone through one crisis after another. But guess what? He was still standing. He was still clinging to the rock. He chose to look to God in hope rather than in despair. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verses 1 through 6, you might want to turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. That isn't the right chapter, I'm guaranteed. I'm going to read the text I got though. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David was strengthened, or he, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That story is found earlier in, uh, I believe it's in... Uh, in chapter 22. You know, storms will come, and sometimes we have to batten down the hatches, and we have to, the key word, in, or the key verse in this text is, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And that's what we have to do sometimes. We have to batten down the hatches and strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God. You know, palm trees are kind of an interesting uh, thing I hadn't thought too much about palm tree. Ever think about the palm tree? Uh, I won't say that they won't ever fall down, but it's very uncommon for a palm tree to fall. Palms are more closely related to grass and lilies and and even onions than to hardwood trees. Inside a palm tree are vascular bundles, tissues that uh, conducts water and nutrients, and each of these bundles is wrapped. Uh, in a ring of cells uh, and they're called bundle sheath and these bundles not only feed and water the palm but they act kind of like reinforcing bars and they give the trunk of a, a plant a palm tree bendability to bend in the wind and that's why when you see on television there's a hurricane coming through and they're broadcasting about the hurricane. You see, you see the palm trees bending, but you don't often, very rarely do you ever see them break. When we trust in the Lord like David and in Jeremiah and like Paul the Apostle, we learn to bend but never break. They all learned that God had been with them through the past. That He was with them in the present. And that He would help them and encourage each of them in the future. That God has promised us with every spiritual blessing. One of my favorite stories found in, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. So David departed from there, he escaped to the cave of Adullam, and when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him. And he became captain over them. Now there was about 400 men with him. 
David was on the run from King Saul. And so he went to Gath to hide, but even there he had to disguise himself, pretending to be a madman to the king of Gath. He was all alone. He retreated to this cave of Adullam, but God didn't forget him. He didn't forget about the promises that God had given to David. And at the time that he needed the most encouragement, what happened? He sent the, God sent the distress, the discontented, the ones who were in debt. They all heard, they went down there to be with David. You know, I think the church ought to be just like that. You know, when someone is going through some hard times, the church is called upon to gather around and to pray and to encourage and to uplift and to visit. The church is called upon to do what God called these folks to do when David departed and escaped to the cave of Adullam. I don't know what about you, but I'm still clinging on to the rock that is higher than I. God has promised that He would never leave us or forsake us. And sometimes He gives us that second wind to keep on going spiritually. And God can give you a second wind if that's what you're needing uh, this morning. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, it says this, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary, if we don't give up, you know, what does he say? It says we can't lose. As Christians, we can't lose. We can't lose unless we give up. And so this morning, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, and that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, Paul writes finally in, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. Amen? Amen.